Hi, my name is Jaden, and welcome to Living with CCI, Craniocervical Instability. So I started this video series at the beginning of this year, 2023. Um, I slowed down a lot, and I haven't made a video, I think, since April. So I wanted to kind of get caught up and um, just share a little bit about some, some more recent uh, information. And you might notice that I'm in a new place. Uh, I, I moved, and so there's actually a little bit of background noise. I, I have some, I'm on a busy street now. So if you hear background noise, that's why. Um, and I did have a surgery late last year, and I, I kind of left a bit of a, a cliffhanger, I guess, in that um, didn't really talk much about it. It was in the midst of a, an insurance appeal. And so I do want to talk about my surgery in this video. Um, it was not a, a CCI fusion surgery, uh, but it was another surgery trying to help treat one of my main symptoms. And uh, I also want to talk a little bit about um, some of the other things I've been doing with the more mainstream medical system um, that have just kind of kept me uh, able to manage uh, my symptoms. Um, and lastly, and, and I think I'll, I'll start off with, with this, this one uh, because it, it's important. And um, I just, first of all, I want to thank everyone for their their comments and their engagement with this series. I mean, it's, it's great. My whole goal was to just try and build more, more awareness, more community of, of people that have CCI. I mean, there's a great diversity of us. Um, but yeah, there, there was a, a comment I just wanted to um, speak to um, because it, 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 it's somebody that's, that's not too happy with me, I, I, don't, I think, uh, about what I'm doing and, and how, I'm, how I'm labeling this, uh, this series and, and such. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that um, first, if I can. So I think the gist of the um, criticism is that uh, this uh, subscriber uh, who commented uh, does not believe I have CCI, uh, thinks that you know I have occipital neuralgia, which I do. I do have occipital neuralgia, uh, but that's that's all I have, and, and there's you know there's definitely no way I have CCI. And even though you know one particular neurosurgeon who's you know an expert at this has said I do, they don't really agree with the way that neurosurgeon does the diagnosis. Um, the gist of it was kind of uh, that, and, and I understand the the point that I don't have a lot of the really bad symptoms that some people with CCI get. And it puts me in a category of, of I guess, a chronic CCI that you can, you can kind of live with. You don't have to have the surgery, although it's still a very different life uh, having CCI, uh, even, even if you don't have the, the horrible symptoms that some people do uh, that you know, eventually require the, the surgery. So, so yeah, I guess I, I want to talk a little bit about um, diagnosis and, and also a little bit about rare diseases and perspective on that, um, you know, just, just where I'm coming from. So yeah, as far as like the diagnosis goes, I mean, this is something that I think is important to a lot of people. Um, it's not true that you have to have crazy symptoms to have CCI. Um, you only have to look at the, you know, the roster of people getting PICL procedures, uh, getting diagnosed by the various neurosurgeons of, the, of which there's, I think four or five now. Um, there are a real range of people. Some of them are quite functional. Some of them can exercise every day. Some of them are still working. Um, and you know, others are extremely disabled. So I guess I, I would say that it, it is true that I, I don't have those extremely severe symptoms. Um, I think that makes me very lucky. And I, I don't want these videos or anything I'm saying to, um, to try and say that you know, CCI is in a serious you know, or is it isn't disabling because it can be for many people. Um, it's not for me. Uh, I'm still able to work and I'm still able to exercise and I can stand up and do these videos. Uh, I actually personally find sitting harder, um, just the positioning, I, I guess. But so, yeah, so I think that we do want to look at, um, you know, CCI is something that is, you know, there's a range and um, I think if, if you only want to, if you only want this particular condition to be including people that have severe symptoms that perhaps would get a fusion, if, you, if that is the criteria that is desired by the community, um, you're going to have a really small population of people that uh, would be considered, right? And, and so one of the benefits of 
looking at CCI from more of a morphology point of view. So if you're, if the, you know, the joints in your upper neck are moving too much and we let, again, we let the neurosurgeons that deal with this stuff, the ones that do the surgeries, they're the ones that kind of look at morphology and symptoms and try to match that up and see, okay, is this person, do we think there's a strong probability they have CCI? And then they give you the diagnosis based on that. Um, but there is a morphology component. It's not just um, that you have to have extreme symptoms. So in, in my case, yeah, I mean, I've had the diagnosis from the people that do the PICL. Um, I mean, you could argue that for business reasons, they overdiagnose it. I mean, that, that may be true. Um, but I don't think they're, PICL is a very dangerous procedure. I don't, I don't think they would give it to somebody that they didn't strongly believe had CCI. Um, and then, yeah, I also had two different neurosurgeons. One of them outright diagnosed me with it. The other say that I, he strongly suspected that I have it. So I, you know, I, I don't feel the need to, to kind of defend my diagnosis. I don't see why I should have to, but based on this comment, I just, I wanted to respond to that. Um, and, and to talk a little bit about rare diseases or what they call a, an orphan diagnosis. I mean, we're definitely CCI would fall in that category. There's just, there's so few people in the population um, that have CCI, I mean, defined based the, the way it is now. Um, and so it, it is a very rare disease. Um, and, you know, I think to get more attention paid to it, uh, we need to acknowledge that, that, that there is a diversity among CCI patients. Um, if CCI is gonna be restricted to only extreme cases, it's gonna be even a more rare disease and even less profitable to develop treatments and to pay attention to it. Um, so again, I just, I kind of question the logic of, you know, me having to, to sort of say that like, I, well, I don't really have CCI because I don't, you know, have terrible symptoms that require a fusion surgery. Um, but basically, you know, I, I have CCI because there's too much movement up there. Uh, and for whatever reasons, luck or genetics or otherwise, I, I don't have the extreme symptoms. Uh, it, it is a bit of a mystery to me as to why, why I don't. You know, I have um, headache, basically constant headache when I'm upright. Um, I have muscle pain in my suboccipitals and I have occipital neuralgia that can flare up um, from time to time. But yeah, the main symptoms are the, the pressure and the head pain. Um, it's not like a typical, like a migraine headache or anything like that. It's, it's a kind of a pressure or head pain um, that I experience um, every day. There's no relief from it at all at this point. Um, and then, yeah, the, the tight muscles, just depending on what I'm doing, how active I am, um, can be quite debilitating as well uh, because that can further exacerbate headaches. And then, of course, simple neuralgia makes getting through any day miserable. Um, so yeah, so th those are my symptoms. I, I don't have the, you know, the, the dizziness or the um, other, other neurological issues that people have with, with CCI where it's actually you know, affecting their, their spinal cord and their nerve function and all that sort of thing. Um, if I had those, I, I would definitely be much more serious about considering a surgery or fusion surgery, um, but I, I'm, Fortunately, have not developed those symptoms at this point. So I am uh, carrying on the best I can. Um, but but yeah, I, I just I wanted to respond to that because I feel like it's it's important to understand that. Um, and I and I really I apologize if I come across as saying like ah CCI is no big deal. Like I can go out and walk every day and I'm still able to work and. Um, it's, it's not for everyone. Like, I think there are certain people that are more high functioning and we don't really know why. I mean, it'd be great if there was more on un, more understanding, uh, more research into this to understand like, why does it affect some people worse than others? I mean, I was a marathon runner before I, you know, developed this problem. Um, so I was in really good shape, you know, obviously I'm not running marathons anymore. Um, but, I was in top shape uh, prior to uh, coming down with, with this condition. And, you know, at this point I'm still able to manage. Um, and I also didn't have an extreme trauma that I know of. Um, and I don't have formal EDS, which is Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, which is another common 
reason people get CCI. So my origin or the cause of my CCI is a little bit unknown. It, it probably is a some kind of connective tissue problem that is, you know, maybe doesn't fall under the classical definition of EDS, but is perhaps related, um, or it's it's just um, some genetic bad luck or something. I, I don't know. Um, I for a while thought like maybe you know I had just like really bad posture in my twenties and you know looking at my phone all the time and but you know the more specialists like even expert level specialists I talk to they're like no bad posture is not gonna like make your ligaments do this you know this is either like a trauma or it's a connective tissue problem uh, and based on the measurements that I've had from upright MRIs and regular MRIs and DMXs and all that, like it's, it, it's moving in the range of beyond normal, which is what gives you the diagnosis of, of CCI. So yeah, so that, that, that's all I want to say about it. I guess I, yeah, just in closing, I really do appreciate all the comments. I do read them all. I do try to get back to everybody. Um, sometimes I don't have a lot of time, so I haven't, um, devoted you know the time to write lengthy replies but I do acknowledge uh, everything that comes in and I my goal with the videos is to just try and tell my perspective of things what my experiences have been um, things I've done and and I hope it helps people and I I don't want it in any way to to belittle like people with severe CCI or, or to say like, oh, they're just, you know, like I, CCI isn't that serious. And it's like, that's not at all what this is about. CCI is very serious. Um, it affects every day of my life from this point. Um, I, there isn't a day I wake up when I feel like normal, um, but um, I'm functional, which I'm very thankful for because uh, not everybody with CCI is. So uh, I think I can move on from that. I'll talk a little bit next, I guess, about my surgery, uh, which was at the end of 2022. Uh, and so I guess the story kind of begins when I was seeing neurosurgeons because I wanted to get a, a diagnosis and I, I kind of learned that they were really the people who give you know, CCI diagnoses because they have to do that in order to decide whether or not you, they would do surgery on you. And so I, I did pursue a couple of consults with the, the neurosurgeons that, that do this, that do these CCI fusion surgeries. And uh, one of them, um, the, the first one was with the surgeon in Spain and he, you know, he looked at all my imaging and you know, he kind of said like, okay, like what, what is it you want from me? And uh, I said, well, I would, first of all, I'd like it, I'd like you to tell me if this, you know, I'd like a diagnosis, I guess. I'd like to know uh, what, you know, what your opinion is about my, my case. And then second of all, I was like, you know, what do I do about it? Because like, it's very, um, yeah, it's a very frustrating way to live. And I, I just, I just wanted his opinion, basically, whether whether surgery is something I should consider or there, if there was some way to, um, something he could do that would help me. So he came back, uh, it was a Zoom appointment, and he said, yeah, I've looked at all your, your films and you, know, you do meet the criteria for uh, both CCI and AAI, so that's the atlantalaxial instability as well as the craniocervical instability. Um, so he's like, so yeah, there you go, there's your, an there's answer, your answer to question number one. Uh, question number two is uh, basically don't get surgery, <laughs> which is what I was expecting to hear. Uh, like I know that because I'm high functioning, my symptoms are mostly kind of pain related that doing a spine surgery, especially one at the upper neck, you know, where the brain up there and like they're just, you know, it's way too risky for somebody that is otherwise functional. And so, yeah, he did not recommend surgery. Uh, he listened to my, he asked me about my symptoms. I, I complained a little bit about my, uh, my upper neck pain and my occipital neuralgia. And he's like, well, there is something surgical you could do to treat your occipital neuralgia. It wouldn't help, it wouldn't help at all with your muscle pain or your joint instability that, you know, really is the, the origin of your, your, all of, all of your symptoms. Uh, but you could treat the the, you know, you, you, you could um, treat the symptom of occipital neuralgia. 
And I was like, okay, well, I'm interested in that. So what, what, what do you have to tell me on that one? He said, there, there was a, uh, he told me that there was a surgeon, a neurosurgeon in Germany who was doing um, stimulators. Uh, so you basically you, you get a, uh, a TENS unit. So if you've been to a physical therapist, you know, those electrode units, they kind of hook up to you and it gives you a little electric current. Uh, you, you get these. You get a stimulator uh, embedded in your occipital nerves, and uh, they they put a battery in, and it's all internal. Um, and basically, you can use this as a pain management kind of strategy. Um, and the batteries are rechargeable, and so you can you know basically the surgery could last you for say like ten years or something like that. So he's like I. I would recommend looking into this. And he said, there's probably somebody in the States where you could do it. Not a lot of options in Europe. He just knew of the one in, in Germany. So yeah, so I was like, okay, well that's like, that's great. Like, you know, thank you. It was like worth the $700 or whatever I had to pay to get this, this consult, which really kind of was more just to, just to hear it from, from him, like as to what his you know, opinion was of my case. So anyway, so I had a takeaway. I had a, a, a to-do item from that visit. And I started to look in the United States to find if I could get this occipital nerve um, stimulator and what that would involve. So I looked at a few places in Los Angeles where I live and I was finding well, I learned I learned a whole bunch of stuff. So I learned that the the original use of these devices was to treat people with like back problems, of course, because there's hundreds of thousands of people in the U.S. with back problems, right? And like they're serious. I don't mean to belittle them. It's just it's a much more common thing that's more profitable for medical uh, device manufacturers. So they came out with these. Uh, they're called spinal cord stimulators and. It's basically a, a micro tens unit that you can put into a certain level of your spine, usually lower back. Um, but what was happening is that they, now that these things have been being put into people for a while, I think like 10, 10 years or more, um, they're getting more um, experimental, I guess, with other possible uses of them. So there's some off-label uh, uses of these spinal cord stimulators where you could treat peripheral nerves, which is, the, which is the, the kind of stimulator I would get because the occipital nerves are, you know, running up the back of your head. And so I'd want to put them on those nerves rather than at my, you know, at, at, on my spinal cord right at the top of my neck, which probably isn't really recommended. So, um, so yeah, so I started being, okay, so what I need is a peripheral occipital nerve stimulator. Uh, and I, yeah, it took a while to find neurosurgeon that, that does this, but I did find one here at UCLA and I got an appointment and went in and basically it was very, um, yeah, it was a very like short appointment as many of them are when you see these like mainstream doctors that have, you know, tons of appointments, but I had, I went in with all my questions and you know, what are the, what are the risks? What are the upsides? What are the downsides and all that? And so, yeah, I just basically like he, he really denied that CCI even existed. He's like, Oh, like I've never heard anything like that. And so, I mean, that I was like, okay, I'm not going to fight this battle with you, dude. Like I've got, a, <laughs> I got more important stuff to talk to you about. Uh, but yeah, he was not interested in any of the information I had from the the Spanish neurosurgeon or the, the you know the MRI measurements and he's like I don't know like no, that's all like none of that stuff is real uh, but he's like but you do have a simple neuralgia which I do I do have a simple neuralgia and he's like and that I can treat and he's like I, I do a lot of these and you know he he puts these stimula this is what the guy does like he puts these stimulators in different places um, he even does some that go right into the brain. I get people with like mental illnesses and stuff like that. So he does some like kind of far out there stuff. I don't know that I'd want one of these things poking right into my brain, but um, he's like, yeah, yours is really easy. It's, you know, just surface the skin almost. And, but I, I was kind of like, okay, well, if, th if this guy's a brain surgeon, basically, which is what he was telling me, like, and I, I looked at his, his bio too, or, you know, his CV or whatever. And like, he basically is a brain surgeon. I'm like, okay, he's, he should be able to put in one of these occipital nerve stimulators. I mean, it, it, it's like, 
it, it is hard, uh, but it's not brain surgery, right? So I had some confidence that you know he would be the he would be somebody I would I would let do this. But he's he said, "Yep, you know we could put in one." He's like, "So what we do, and this is important for people to hear. If you're if you're like me and you have this as a symptom, um, they do a trial." And uh, it's good. I mean, they, they basically, it's a trial where you have an external system uh, for about a week and you see if you like it. Uh, what they ask for is a 50% or more reduction in pain. And uh, then if you, if you say that, you know, yeah, it's helped me and it's more than 50%, they will put in the permanent implant. So it's, it's actually two surgeries. Uh, so keep that in mind. Like if you're, you know, planning this out, it's like, there's quite a bit of time and there's like, you have to get a pre-clearance and like, it, it, you know, anything you would normally do for a, for a full on surgery, like you have to do it twice. And so there's, there's time and money involved. But he's like, yep, yeah, you know, we could get you booked for a trial uh, on this date. And I had, you know, all the requirements, it was general anesthesia and all that jazz, um, which is, I guess, just his policy. Like it, I've seen online and watch some, you know, there's pain management docs that put these in without general anesthesia as well. Um, because it's, it's, you know, it's not like they're completely cutting you open. They're just, they're putting in the leads like for the set, for the, for the test one, <laughs> the permanent one. Yeah, of course it's like general because you're getting a battery put in and wiring put through your tunneled through your back and stuff like that. But anyway, the, the test basically they, they use a, a special, um, needle, I guess, that puts the lead up where it needs to go. And then they, and then you have the wires like coiled up around the back of your head and they put a bunch of surgical tape over it. And then it, it runs down to this thing you sort of wear on a belt. Um, so yeah, so you have to walk around for a week with a spool of wires behind your neck and a belt mounted like TENS unit essentially. And you get a little remote control to, to run the thing. Um, so it, yeah, it's kind of like, it's annoying because, you know, it, it looks weird, uh, but you know, this is what you have to do, right? So it's, it's annoying and it's, um, uh, you know, it, like you're not supposed to shower because they're worried about infection. Of course they have, they have leads going from the outside to the inside of your body and they don't want germs to travel up there. So they tell you not to have a shower, which I, I kind of cheated. I had like a lower body shower, uh, but I didn't let any water like spray up around the back of my head. Um, they do shave your, your hair back there as well. So they can see what they're doing. Um, so anyway, so I had this uh, trial for a week and I was the bionic man with the wire, with the wires and everything else. And they tell you to, to, you know, basically do what you would normally do, you know, work. And I was like, well, can I work out? He's like, well, I don't want you sweating. And I'm like, well, it's kind of hard to work out if I'm not sweating. He's like, well, you know, work out, you know, lighter then. And, uh, I guess they don't want you sweating because you could, it can start to loosen the tape they put around. I don't know. It just, whatever. I mean, it was a winter time, fortunately. So I was able to get some, you know, to do some of my usual activities without a lot of sweating because he didn't want me sweating. Um, and yeah, I, w you know, I, I was kind of, I had mixed feelings about the trial. I really did. I was like, well, you know, I kind of like this, but I don't know, like this is a permanent implant and it's not, it's not like, it's not at all like it was like, whoa, this is awesome. You know, it was kind of like, you know, this is a tool that I think would be useful um, I wouldn't want to spend a lot of money on it, uh, but if it's something that my insurance is going to cover and, you know, I trust that the surgeon is going to do a good job and, you know, make everything look not too bad as far as the incisions and like, I was like, yeah, you know, I mean, I think this, it helps me enough and it's a tool that I can use and I can turn it on and off and I can control it. And I have a, a, a rep from the company that makes these things that I can call any time they can reprogram it. They can change the settings. Um, and he actually did that during the trial. He, it wasn't working so well the first few days. And he's like, well, let me try you at hundred Hertz. Uh, we don't, we don't usually start people at hundred Hertz, but um, some people like it. And so he put me at a higher frequency and I'm like, oh yeah, that's like quite a bit better. So I, I still, to this day, like run it at hundred Hertz. Um, 
and you know I can increase the intensity of it as I need to. And so so yeah. Long story short, like I I wasn't I wasn't totally sold by the thing, but I'm I'm sort of evaluating it. I'm thinking, well, like I I don't have a lot of options. I mean I I don't really want to take a bunch of crazy like opioid pain medication later in life uh, because that's just a recipe for uh, misery in my opinion um, and you know I, I, I'm kind of done with like I'm not wasting more money on unproven treatments and regenerative medicine and stuff unless, the, unless I really have a, a strong unless there's a lot of data behind it and, and I feel you know really confident in it so it's like okay this is an option for me it's safe um, it's reasonably effective, although it's, it's really just treating a symptom. I mean, it's, it's kind of a, uh, it's distracting me from the pain. Like it, it uh, literally is not changing anything about my CCI or healing in any way. It's just a way to distract yourself from pain, which travels through nerves. So you kind of use some electricity on the nerve. It kind of gives it another input. And that, that's sort of the theory of, of how these things work. So anyway, so I like, and of course the sales rep was freaking out because he, he could tell I was really on the fence and you know, they want to sell these things. And I'm just like, oh yeah, this is America. I, how could I forget? Like, of course the sales rep is going to be calling me every day. Like, oh, what do you think? You like it? You like, you know, you're going to get one, you know, like, so I'm like, yeah, whatever. Like I'll, I'll, we'll see you when I go back for my follow-up. I went back for the follow-up and I'll get these darn wires out of my head, please. And I said, okay, fine. Like I'm gonna, I'm gonna proceed with this uh, as long as it gets approved by my insurance. Like I'm not paying, you know, a hundred thousand dollars for this thing, um, which is roughly what it costs to get it put in. Um, well, it's a little. I think it's more like probably around eighty or something with the when they adjust it, you know, for the insurance rates. So yeah, so basically the, the surgeon was pleased. He's like, okay, you know, we'll get you on the calendar. Um, and he's like, okay, so as we talked about, and he, and he did tell me, you know, even before the trial, like the, the and I'll tell everyone now. So upsides and downsides. So the, um, one of the big downsides to having one of these uh, where I have it, which, which is um, uh, peripheral, is I, I can never have an MRI. So these devices are MRI safe. They have been you know, studied and approved for MRI use, like obviously when they're, they're turned off. Um, but all of those studies and all of that paperwork and all of that approval has gone into the people that have them as spinal cord stimulators you know, for their back pain or whatever. So all of those people have the exact same device in their bodies, can have MRIs, but I can't have an MRI because uh, I'm because it's being used in a different way and it's not been studied and there just aren't enough people that have these peripheral implants. Uh, and so in, in the abundance of safety, uh, I'm not allowed to have an MRI. And you, know, and you might ask the question, well, like what if you just forget that you have it and don't put it on the floor? And the, uh, apparently they know. Um, and I didn't ask, I, w I wish I'd asked like, well, how do they know? Um, either there is a like registry of people who get these that the MRI people all are able to like look up um, or they would just see it right away and like in the, the overview image, you know, the, when you get an MRI, they do like a overview so they can target it. They would see that you have one of these and they'd be like, hold on a second, you, you need to get out of this uh, MRI. Uh, so I don't know, but he basically is like, he's like, no, they'll know. He's like, you can't, you can't just pretend you don't have it, they will know. And so you can't, you can't get an MRI. You can get an X-ray, you can get a CT, um, you can probably get other kinds of, but you cannot get a magnetic-based uh, imaging scan. Um, there is a loophole that he shared with me, which I probably shouldn't talk about, but there, there is a way to get one if I really, really needed it. Um, but the official way to get one is, um, to have it taken out, like you have another surgery to have the implant removed, and then you can go get the MRI after you've recovered from the, the surgery with the ticket out. Uh, in other words, like I don't think anybody would do that, <laughs> I mean, unless you desperately have to have the MRI. So, so anyway, so that is like probably the number one downside of getting it. 
Um, the other one is that um, the battery is it's rechargeable. It's a wireless recharging, kind of like your like some of the newer phones are like that now. Um, so it's yeah, it's rechargeable, but the battery the the longevity of the battery system is about ten years. So um, yeah, so that's another thing to consider as well. Um, and yeah, I mean I. Uh, there aren't really too many other downsides to it. I mean, you do have, I have an incision. I don't know if I can, if people can see it, sort of, maybe. I have a fairly large incision on the back of my neck, um, which has healed nicely. He did a good job, but it, it's, you know, it's a scar. And then I have a, a, a more cleanly healed one because it didn't require stitches. It was just taped together in my lower back, which is where the battery is. The battery is about the size of an Oreo cookie. At least that's what they told me. And it feels like that's basically true. I don't really feel the battery. Um, there's a little bit of pressure back there if I push on it, um, but it doesn't limit me in anything I'm doing. Um, there is a wire basically going through my back um, up around my, you know, up to the back of my neck. Uh, I have no idea how they do that because I don't have like a big long incision going up my back, but they have some kind of tunneling tool that can push this wire up my, the inside. And, you know, I, I, I don't know. I didn't ask any more questions than that. So yeah, you get two incisions. Um, the other thing that, you know, I, and I actually asked this before I even agreed to the trial, sort of was saying like, okay, like, I've been through a lot, and one of the things I find with any treatment, especially around pain, is that my body kind of gets smart and tunes it out. You know, like certain drugs or certain um, chiropractic, like upper cervical chiropractic treatment, things like that, where it's like at first it's like, oh, this is working great. Like, well, I can't believe I waited so long and now, you know. And then once I sort of get into it, um, I realized that, oh, like it's actually, you know, it's lost its effectiveness, you know, within a month or something. It's so like, am I going to get this surgery and have this thing stop, you know, basically not be as effective? And he, he was kind of, yeah, you know, he was like, he's like, yeah, I mean, that's, that's part of pain science that, I mean, you'd win the Nobel Prize if you could figure out that. I mean, the body take stimulus and you know when you when it gets a new stimulus it's very excited and it tries to figure it out and it you know it it, it makes the it makes the treatment effective um, and then it will tune out any kind of constant background noise um, and so that input you know the the electrical stimulation becomes less effective um, but he said the caveat to that is you can change the settings so these are very configurable units and you can increase the frequency and the intensity and um, you can have it cycle so that it's running for 20 minutes and then it's off for so many minutes and then it's on again. And so he's like, you know, it, it, what you're saying is true. Like you will develop a bit of a, you know, I guess resistance to this thing uh, and that it won't work as well for you over time. But it, you know, that's not the end of, that's not the end of the story. Like there are still things you can do that don't involve like having like yet another surgery. Um, so yeah, so that, that was basically the, the summary of it. So it started with a suggestion from a, a Spanish neurosurgeon that fuses people with CCI. Uh, and, you know, because I think he, he does, and, and that surgeon, I mean, said to me that like, yeah, a lot of his patients have occipital neuralgia. The ones that get the surgery have occipital neuralgia. For those patients, he actually will uh, remove the occipital nerve because um, they find that it, uh, you know, it, 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 like even post fusion, it's causing them uh, problems. So he'll, he'll take the nerve right out. Obviously, like they don't want to do that to somebody that, that doesn't need a fusion. Like it's, you know. Removing the nerve is, is not, not something I was really, uh, that's not the kind of surgery I'm looking for. So, you know, he just thought, okay, well, this, this is something you could do that's a very minor surgery. And, you know, probably in Europe isn't that expensive. Of course, here it is, but, um, but we have insurance. Most of, most of us have insurance, I guess, hopefully. Um, if you don't, I mean, this is like a very expensive option, potentially. Uh, maybe try going to Europe. I don't know. Like, um, anyway, so yeah, so um, 
and ended up kind of, you know, working out for me. As far as, um, I guess the last thing I can talk about is like how I use it and how it's going. Uh, so I had the surgery right before Christmas last year. It is now September. So I've had this thing inside of me for nine months and I use it almost every day. I do like having it. I don't regret ever getting the surgery. I think that it's, it's been a very useful tool in my toolkit to treat my symptoms. Um, there are a few days that I probably forget to use it, but I, as I say, most days that I remember, I, I use it. I do not use it all day. I do not sleep with it on. So I find that I'm, and I can show you the, this is the little controller they give you. Uh, I guess there's the screen there, it kind of lights up so I can, you know, I can change the, the settings on it and all that. Uh, I would love to have a phone app for it, but of course that's not offered because it's a medical device and it, you know, requires all that safety and testing and everything else. So you, this is what you get. And if you lose this, it's like $5,000, it's crazy. Uh, of course they, they have insurance that'll sell you too, but um, so yeah, so I, I use the controller. I do have to have the controller with me if I'm planning to change the settings. Um, as far as when I, when I specifically make a, a point of using it, I find later in the day, I have it on right now, for example. Um, yeah, later in the day, it's very helpful to have it on at a low level. It just kind of takes the stress of the day off the area a little bit. Like, I don't really need it usually when I first wake up uh, because I feel okay because um, I've been laying down for several hours. Uh, sleep, I don't find, like I can have it on when I sleep, that's fine. It's not a problem, but I just don't need it. And I feel I might as well conserve the battery. So I don't use it when I sleep. Um, I use it for any significant amount of upright time, which is like making this video, uh, going to a social event. It's extremely useful because it, it, it distracts me from that pain that used to be so limiting for me, uh, where I'd be like trying to wring out my neck because I would feel all the muscles and the pain and, um, so I find now if I have to go to a meeting for work, like an in-person meeting, or I'm at a social event where I'm standing a lot or sitting a lot, or if I'm on an airplane, um, it's very useful to have this thing. And I just, I run it at a, a fairly low level. You can almost not feel the, the electrical pulses. And, and this is something I learned from the trial, actually, that they said to me, you know, um, you don't feel like you have to run this thing so you're, you know, you're feeling like the electric jolts or whatever. Like you can run it at what they call sub-perception level. So you, can, you don't even really notice it, but it's still treating you. It's still a therapeutic um, treatment, even if you don't feel it, because there is like a small current. So yeah, so basically I, I use it daily, uh, but not all day and not all the time. And I use it at a pretty low setting. And, you know, I'd say the only thing is I just have to remember, like, if I'm going to want to change the settings or turn it on or off, I have to have the controller with me. Um, and, and then as far as the battery goes, like I charge the, because I am using it at such a low power, uh, I find I only have to charge the battery about every six weeks. So that's a pretty low, you know, requirement. I, and to charge it, I just, I wear a, a belt. The, like a, a web belt thing that has the, the charging puck on it. And you have to wear the thing for like a few hours, I think, for it to recharge the battery. So, so yeah, so that's my surgery. Um, it's, it's not a cure. It's not, it's not gotten rid of all my pain and, and uh, you know, problems as a result of having CCI. But it, it is one of the things I've been using to manage my pain to allow me to live a bit more of life and go out and do things and um, not feel like I'm, you know, in, not, not that it was ever agonizing, but I, I just, yeah, I, before I had this thing, I would just be so fearful when I had to go out for three or four hours, knowing that I was going to be in pain and I was going to be fighting my joints to keep my head held up. And, um, and now it, it does kind of, take that edge off uh, on the anxiety level, but it also does it just by distracting the nerves from, you know, 
triggering that, that response to the pain. Now, there's a bit of a caveat, and then I'll close because I probably talked about this for too much, but a bit of a caveat here in that um, just because you don't feel something doesn't mean that it's not happening. So if anyone's ever had their, um, their mouth frozen, you know, you get like dental work and they freeze your, you know, and they tell you don't drink anything hot until the freezing has worn off, right? Like, you know, why do they tell you that? Because you could be drinking like hot coffee or something and burning your mouth like all through and not even feel it, right? Because you've got the, the freezing in, the, in your gums. And then, you know, once the freezing wears off, you're like, oh my God, what have I done to my mouth, you know? And so it's kind of the same thing with my stimulator. If I go and overdo it uh, at a social event or, or whatever, I may not feel the pain at the time, but when I come home and I turn it off and I realize like, oh, I pushed a lot harder than I should have or, you know, so I do have to be mindful of the fact that although it can help mask the pain, um, it, it doesn't mean that it, you know, I, I can just ignore the fact that um, those, those activities are hard for me and require uh, appropriate pacing, um, which, you know, is something I'm working on. Um, because that's just part of any chronic condition is activity pacing. So, yeah. So anyways, I, I think that's enough about the surgery. Um, sorry, it took so long to explain all of that, but there was a lot of money involved and I wasn't, I wasn't about to, uh, jeopardize the insurance claim, you know, by giving information that maybe would have not been, uh, useful for, for either, either party, I guess, but, um, that's all been settled and I have my stimulator and, you know, everybody's happy, I suppose. Uh, although I, I have, I'm very cynical about the healthcare insurance system in the United States. Like it, the, the level of inefficiency is just like for a country that has so many great in, innovations and uh, like so much wealth, like it, it's, it's embarrassing how poor our, our system, how disorganized our system is really, and the amount of attention that's, or the, just the amount of time and money that's wasted in, in dealing with insurance. Um, but yeah, so that is the story of my surgery. Um, and okay, so the last thing I guess I wanna get to, I just wanna check the time here. Oh my goodness. Oh, 42 minutes, okay. So I'll, I'll, I'll cover one more kind of general topic and then I guess I can, I can close it off. But so, Another thing I guess I want to talk about is, you know, I think when you have something chronic like this, you, you do really need to have ongoing medical care. Um, I think it's helpful for your, your sort of stamina in dealing with this and, and just having, having a resource that sort of knows who you are and you don't have to sort of justify things over and over and over again. And, and so you, you basically what I'm trying to say is that you, when you have CCI or something like CCI, you need to have a medical team that will uh, follow you, you know, for the rest of your life, or at least while you're living in a certain geographic area. And that team is not going to include your neurosurgeon because when you're, when your surgery is over, and they are satisfied they haven't given you an infection or you don't need any, you know, revisions or anything, you're done. Like, they don't really want to see you. I mean, I'm sure they do, but they, like, whatever. They're, they're in the business of giving more people surgery. They don't want to be like, oh, how are you? How's your pain? Like, I'll, like, so, and the same with PICL. Like, you know, if you fail the PICL, like I did, you know, you're done. Like, there, there's nothing more they can do for you. They're not interested in being there as a as a resource uh, because, and, and I get it. I mean, they, they need to take their time and try to help other people, which, which sounds harsh, but, but it's true. Like what they're doing is very specialized and it didn't work for me. And therefore I don't really, there's no, I have no business going there. So wh what I'm explaining is just that like, when you, when you try to treat CCI uh, by going to all these very highly specialized medical professionals, they will give you what they have and then you're done. And so what you do need to have is a team that you don't have an expiration date. Like you, you can keep going 
they will see you for the rest of your days. You know, like, so you kind of need to figure out where am I going to get that? Now, for some people, if you have a really good kind of family doctor, general practitioner that believes in CCI and understands enough about all the nuance of it, uh, great. You know, that can be the person that you, uh, you, you use and, you know, they can get you your prescriptions. They can make sure that your, you know, your physical therapy is getting covered by your insurance, what, whatever. I mean, they can, they could be your, your advocate essentially. Um, I think for most people, um, listening to this video are like, yeah, that like my general doctor is like not that person. And in my case, like I didn't even have one cause I was young and healthy really until I had this. So um, then the question is like, which sort of, you know, you, you kind of have to look a little higher up the chain, I guess, and, or the pyramid um, of medicine. And so I, I think, uh, you know, and it, it can just depend on where you feel most comfortable. I ended up kind of in the neurology, headache care type of area. Um, and it's sort of been what I've done for the last, I guess, six years or so when I lived, I lived in San Diego for a while and I was seeing a neurologist there as kind of an ongoing thing. And, and yeah, and so when I, when my surgery was over and my surgeon was, you know, done with me, um, I started to look into, okay, like I need to find, um, a program that I can kind of get set up with. And so, yeah, I actually started looking and found a, um, a headache center, you know, and so I realized, okay, they're going to, you know, they're going to have a lot of people that have migraines, but I'm going to give them a chance because I, as I was reading more information about what they do, it's, it's at USC, which is the other um, health system here in, in Los Angeles. Uh, but yeah, they, they treat a lot of people with really bad occipital neuralgia. Um, they treat, you know, other things to do with um, nerve problems. Um, so I was like, okay, well, I'm going to give this group a shot because it seems like, you know, there's a little bit more to it than just, you know, putting me on the latest like migraine medication or whatever, which I've done that. And I, I don't need to do more of that because I don't really have migraines. So, yeah, so I, I've been quite pleased with it. Um, it has its limitations, but yeah, I, I was able to get in in January uh, to see the neurologist and she, yeah, she really did find uh, my story interesting. Um, I don't think she's had anyone that has uh, CCI, you know, officially. Um, she's definitely had a lot of people with upper neck problems and, you know, similar conditions, the headaches coming from, uh, you know, neck issues. So she was like, yeah, you know, like we'll, we'll put you in our, in our group. And so what basically what it entailed was some uh, pain psychology uh, appointments with a, with a specialist, a psychologist, um, or maybe it's a psychiatrist, I don't know, one of those. So yeah, there was this pain psychology thing that you had to do, um, or that they at, least, they at least want you to give it a go. Um, you're not required to do it, but uh, you're, you know, basically signed. <laughs> Part of signing up, you're getting some initial appointments. Uh, I did some OT or occupational therapy. Uh, that was kind of around, you know, planning the day and pacing of activities and figuring out what things trigger my issue the most and how to kind of reorganize that, you know, so it was kind of a very practical thing. Um, and, uh, and then the other thing that they do, she's like, okay, well, you, you know, your issue, um, your head, your headache, which is, you know, what they, they just consider it a headache. They don't deal with CCI as something so specific. So they're like, you know, your issue is coming from, you know, tight muscles in your neck. Uh, one of the treatments that they offer that's fairly um, innovative, I, I guess it's very basic treatment, but you, you actually get an IV of magnesium, uh, once a month. So I was like, okay, well, that sounds interesting. I like, I'm happy to take the oral, you know, supplement magnesium like I have. And it, it does actually, I find magnesium in the past has really helped me with, with muscle pain. Like even when I was a runner. So she said, oh yeah, like, and we find that, uh, when people get it, uh, as an IV, it's a, it's a different compound. I think it's, mag, it's magnesium. It's different than the one you get in the pill. Uh, she, she said they find that people, um, it, it really helps and it helps settle the, 
you know, those tight muscles down. Uh, but it is globally, like it's not just treating your upper neck, obviously it's treating everything. So yeah, so I've been doing that once a month. I do believe it helps. And most importantly, uh, if you've heard my videos and you know, I, I'm, uh, I'm always one that looks at the, the, the dollar figures and the bottom line is it, it's very cheap. Um, it's like when my insurance has processed it, it's only about 20 bucks. So <laughs> yeah, if I can do something that helps a little bit and gives me a little bit of a feeling of like, I am at least part of the medical system and they're giving me some kind of care and it's only going to cost me 20 bucks a month. Like, sure. Why not? You know? And, and I think it, it does help a little bit. I mean, if, if it were costing me $500 a month, I'd be like, yeah, I don't know. Like, I don't know if this is really helping me that much. Um, so, so yeah, so I basically found uh, a program that has a bunch of different specialties and uh, been able to kind of take what I, take what I want from them, I guess. And, you know, I've learned things from the OT. Um, I, I probably found that the least valuable of, of the whole package, but, uh, but I did learn things um, and particularly uh, activity pacing and really putting some advanced thought into uh, how you structure your day. Uh, and then the pain psychology, definitely, uh, you know, just basic things of how you can influence your pain levels, you know, by, um, by actually having uh, relaxation time in your day. Uh, and there's some different exercises that can help you to relax. Um, so that was useful uh, as well as some you know, discussion of like certain aspects of my life that uh, do add additional stress that, you know, I could definitely don't help when you have a chronic issue that, you know, causes pain. So that, that was useful, uh, but also kind of came to an end a little earlier than the maximum number of sessions because it's kind of like, well, like there's not a lot of, uh, I don't have a lot of stress in my life. Uh, and I also, you know, uh, while I, I have no problem with learning relaxation techniques and um, all of that breathing and I, I just, um, you know, there's a limit to how much of that I can do. I, I, I just have a hard time uh, buying into that kind of thing. So, but, you know, they did, I did do it and I did see the benefit of it and I have it as a tool. And, um, and, and then my, my magnesium infusions, um, I, I really like it. It's a nice routine. I go out there. It's very relaxing. I mean, the day I get it, it's just like, oh, this is great. You know, it does fade pretty quickly though. It's, it's a, it, it's, it feels more short term, but I think there is some carryover and they, they will do it about once a month. So um, if you time it, you know, before, like I try to do it before I'm going to, you know, if I'm going on a trip or something, I'll try to get the mag, they call it IV mag. I'll try to get that like a few days before I go and it kind of does help me get off on the right start. Um, and uh, yeah, the other thing I would say is like, and I get my prescriptions. So because in the States, like the doctors have figured out that, you know, they don't have to give you that many refills because if they don't give you very many refills, it means you have to come back and you have to pay them. Uh, again, my cynicism, I'm sorry, people in the medical, everybody has to make a living. I get it. But um, yeah, I, where I had been going before, I, I was like, hey, this is getting ridiculous. I've taken these, these pills for four years, like dosage, nothing is changing. My condition's not changing. Why am I coming in every two months or, and having to pay like for a $130 office visit? So yeah, so I, as part of all this, like I just have a neurologist that I really only see once a year. And then I have this, this program that I can, um, it, like there's a menu of things I can choose from and I'm already in the system so I can, you know, I can do them uh, kind of a la carte, I guess. Um, so I think it's great, uh, but you know you have to look at what's available in your city. Is there is there a multidisciplinary program like this that will sort of take you in and keep you you know for as long as you need it? Uh, because I think it's very helpful, and I think that it it does give you some peace of mind just knowing that you have some resources there, and at the very least, like you just get your you know your prescriptions done and you don't have to pay an arm and a leg for that um, because we already, people, people with CCI, it's like we are already paying enough, you know, if you've been through the, 
the gamut of different uh, scans and DMXs and, and oh my God, regenerative treatments. I mean, you're, you're talking probably approaching $100,000 or, or more. So yeah, it's nice to have something that's, you know, reasonably affordable. So anyways, I think I've probably gone on long enough. Um, I, yeah, I, you know, I, I don't really have a lot more to go through. I mean, I, I am where I am. I, I guess I'll just close by saying that, um, you know, I, I, I do feel very fortunate, I guess, to be a functional human being, but I really hate this. Like if I could just snap my fingers and make this go away, I mean, oh my God, like I do not like living like this. Um, and it is every waking day. Uh, I do get some relief when I am in bed uh, or when I'm sleeping. I don't notice anything. But I mean, this is an awful way to live. And I think everybody here listening and, and that's participated, you know, with comments and others um, it understands like it, it's this is not something uh, that's very that's easy to deal with. It's just not. And a big part of that is all the symptoms of which, you know, I don't have the worst. I mean, people have it way worse than me. I, and I talked about that at the beginning. You know, I am very lucky not to have the really dis disabling symptoms. But I still have a really bad uh, time of it <laughs> um, compared to how I was before, you know, when I was um, able to live basically a normal life. And I, I don't have that anymore. So... Um, yeah, but you know, I, I just, I'm trying to look at the bright side of what I do have and, you know, the things that I can still do and the resources that are available to me and, um, trying to make the best of it. And so, you know, that's, that's kind of where I'm at. I, I don't, again, I don't want this to come across as like, everyone can be like me because we're not all the same. You know, we have different symptoms. We have different histories. We have we may have gotten CCI in a different way. We're, we're all different. And I don't want to say like, oh, like if you just have a positive attitude, you can, you can be just fine. It's, it's not, you know, I'm not, I am not just fine. And if you have CCI, you're probably not going to be just fine. But you have to look at it and really think about like, okay, like there, it's a rare condition. It's really hard. There are, there's just not a lot of profit in, treatments being developed. Um, there are a few, but they're very experimental. Um, and then of course, some of them like surgeries are, are very extreme. So you have to really weigh your options and consider, you know, what, um, what you can do um, that's, you know, affordable and low risk. And um, just try to focus on the things that you still can do uh, and adapt as best you can. So so that is where I'll leave things. I, I think I've gone on for long enough. Uh, but yeah, I, I've enjoyed doing this. Uh, I Yeah, I mean, I plan to, to continue. It's not going to be at a, a very um, regular pace. But I mean, I can definitely provide updates um, over the years. And, um, you know, I yeah, I, I feel like I've, I've kind of I've covered my whole my whole story here and, and talked a little bit about, um, you know, the the, the the end of my it's not well it's not the end but as far as like dealing with you know all of the treatments available and everything else so I, so hopefully hopefully it's been useful for people um hopefully you believe that i have cci because like not everyone does and, and that's okay you know i i you could disagree with me i'm happy to have your comments like no matter either way um but uh try to think of it as like you know this is a inclusive kind of community of people and, and we all have d different um, experience with CCI. And um, in my case, like it's, it's, you know, it's my experience and um, that's what I have to share. So I will leave it there. Uh, so yeah, we'll, until next time, 